little bit different than um, because I'm a first year PhD student and I don't have enough research done to give a full hour long talk about my research. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what I was up to before coming to Austin to do my PhD. Um, the title of my talk is From Shake Alert to Shake It Off, Lessons from Natural Hazards Communication Through Social Media. I will give context for what that all means, but I thought it was pretty clever. <laughs> um, but yeah, first, just like a little bit about me, since um, I know I'm still sort of new to a lot of people, first year PhD student, um, I'm working with Damien Safer and Laura Wallace on slow slip events in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, I'm happy to talk about my research whenever, but just not right now, because instead, I'm going to talk about what I did in undergrad. Um, so like Michaela said, I got my bachelor's degree from the University of Washington in Earth and Space Sciences. And while I was there, I got a job at the Pacific Northwest Seismic Network. Um, and I started in February 2020, and then basically all the way through um, through June of last year before I came here, I worked as a lab and outreach assistant. Um, and so for those that don't know, the PNSN is the authoritative seismic network for the states of Washington and Oregon. So anytime an earthquake happens in Washington and Oregon, uh, this is the organization that is responsible for telling people about it and, you know, determining the magnitude, the location, all the info about it. They're, main, uh, they're responsible for maintaining all of the sites in the states of Washington and Oregon, over 500 stations at this point. Um, so it's a lot. It's a big job. Um, they work closely with the USGS Cascades Volcano Observatory to also monitor the volcanoes in Washington and Oregon. Um, because as you may know, uh, the Pacific Northwest is on, sits on the Cascadia subduction zone, so there is a lot of earthquake and volcanic hazard in the area, so it's important for someone to be paying attention and watching. Um, and of course, if you have seismic hazard in the area, it's not just a scientifically interesting problem, but it's a problem for the people that actually live there as well. So being able to communicate information about geohazards is a really important part of what the PNSN does. Um, and so just sort of a, this is a map of all the stations um, in the seismic network, just to sort of point out, you can see that there's a lot concentrated on the west coast because that's where a lot of the earthquake hazard is. Um, there's sort of, you know, and a lot of the population. Um, these little yellow circles are where some of the volcanoes are. Um, and this little cluster over here is the Hanford nuclear site, which PNSN is also um, responsible for monitoring. Uh, I just want to briefly mention what ShakeAlert is, because if you have not lived on the West Coast, you may have not heard about it. Um, but basically, there's this new technology that was uh, just recently released to the public in the last couple of years called ShakeAlert. So if you are in the states of Washington, Oregon, or California, and there is a large enough earthquake, you will, in theory, hopefully, probably, get um, an alert on your phone before shaking from that earthquake actually reaches you. Um, and basically that can work because P waves travel faster than S waves um, and the speed of light at which information travels on the internet is faster than the speed of seismic waves. And so basically we can detect that an earthquake has already started to happen, um, send an alert out to people that might feel shaking from that earthquake um, and uh, hopefully warn people so that they can take protective action like drop cover and hold on and uh, prepare themselves for the earthquake. Obviously it is not earthquake prediction. It is just an alert that an earthquake is on the way and that you should be prepared. Um, and this project has driven a lot of the expansion of the seismic network in the last decade or so. So a lot of those 500 stations have only, um, are pretty new, have only been built in the last couple of years um, due to funding from Shakler, because it takes a really dense seismic network in order for this to work. Um, so I just wanted to mention sort of what that was since I put it in the title of my talk. <laughs> So what did I do for the PNSN? Um, I'm not a seismologist. I am, uh, my role is more in science communication. And so um, as the lab and outreach assistant, my main duty was basically anything that involved talking with general audiences, uh, talking between general audiences and the seismologists and scientists that ran and operated the PNSN. So I operated our social media sites. Um, we have a website where I also posted like blogs and other website content. YouTube channel, and then our main two social media channels were Facebook and Twitter. I'm going to call it Twitter and not X. <laughs> if you have a problem with that, 
too bad. <laughs> um, I also manage our uh, email account um, and our phone lines. So anytime, basically anyone had a question, um, I would be the first person to sort of see that question and try to answer it. Um, we also do lab tours. The PNSN has a lab space at the University of Washington campus. Um, and so there we would host mainly school groups, but really anyone, any group that wanted to come in for a tour was welcome. So sometimes we'd host like, um, old folks homes or um, just any other sort of community group that wanted to come and learn about earthquakes. Um, I would go out into the, the field field um, to do community outreach events. So I spent an entire day once in the city of Wenatchee, Washington, talking to every sixth grader in the city of Wenatchee um, on a single day. It was a lot of fun. Um, and then occasionally I would get to go to some of our pretty seismic stations. Um, it wasn't really part of my main job, but sometimes I got to go along, which is fun. Mm -hmm. um, so what I wanted to talk about today is this sort of role that I had of communicating about science. Everything is going to be in this sort of earthquake geohazards lens, but I think a lot of the stuff that I learned in this job and that I want to talk about today is applicable no matter what your discipline is or like how you're communicating. So it doesn't have to be social media specific, doesn't have to be earthquake specific, um, but that'll be sort of the lens that I talk through today. So just to kind of give you an example, um, there are a couple like themed posts that the PNSN would always do. Obviously, anytime there was an earthquake um, above magnitude three, we would post about it because someone probably felt it. Um, and so, you know, you randomly feel an earthquake, you're going to want to know like, hey, what was that? So since it was our job to tell people, that was sort of our um, our, one of our main categories of types of posts we would do. Um, we also do Fieldwork Friday posts where every Friday we just post like fun pictures of fieldwork that went on that week. Um, we would post about anniversaries or notable events. So actually just a couple days ago was the 324th anniversary of the last Cascadia subduction zone earthquake. Um, it's a really cool story about how we know it was exactly on January 26th um, that I'm happy to tell later, but I, I won't go into right now. Um, but so things like that, um, and basically just anything that will sort of gather engagement about earthquake hazards in the region. And so, yeah, that's what I'll talk about today. There's a cool picture of Mount Olympus, so fun. <laughs> um, okay, so why is communicating about science important? Um, well, first and foremost, especially for geohazards, um, people need to know the science behind what is causing these hazards um, in the area they live. Um, and knowing some of that science really gives people a sense of control over what's going on. Um, something I really took out of this experience working for the Seismic Network was that um, when people know even just a little bit of the science behind what is going on and like the hazards in the region, it really makes them feel a lot more comfortable um, and they have a sense of agency in um, responding to the hazards. So like, you know, if there was going to be an earthquake or a volcanic eruption, if you know a little bit about what's going on, like why these things are happening, you're gonna feel a little bit more prepared to take some action to hopefully protect yourself um, than you would have if you just like absolutely know nothing. Um, a lot of people would be sort of you know, like, oh my gosh, I don't know anything about earthquakes or volcanoes. And I, it's like too overwhelming. I don't even want to think about it. Um, but if you can give them just a little bit of information, then they feel a little bit more empowered to say build an earthquake kit or um, learn what shape alert is or um, know their tsunami evacuation route, things like that. Um, so yeah, and it also makes people feel really involved. Um, but if you know a little bit about what's going on, you want to sort of keep up with what's going on. So, um, you know, you kind of get repeat engagement with people when they understand a little bit of the science of what's going on. Um, and then of course, no matter what field you're in, no matter where you are, there are always stakeholders who deserve to be able to understand the work that you do. So it's pretty obvious in the case of the Seismic Network who the stakeholders might be, it's just the people living in our region because they deserve to know about earthquakes. Um, but it could be the people that live in the area that you do field work or whatever it might be that's relevant to your work. There are people that have some stake in whatever it is you're doing um, and they deserve to be able to understand what you're doing with the information that you get out of your science. So these are sort of my, my key takeaways for things that I think make good science communication. And I'll sort of give some examples and stuff and talk, talk through it, but I just sort of wanted to point these out. 
it takes a lot of patience to be able to do this effectively, um, especially on social media. <laughs> uh, it is, it's really difficult. And I think it's something that we don't really practice enough as scientists. And so um, it takes patience with yourself because you're gonna get it wrong at some point. It takes patience with the other person because understanding a complicated subject is difficult as we can all understand. Um, and so, yeah, it just, it takes patience to, to be a good science communicator, in my opinion. Um, it also takes empathy. You can't be a robot that is just sort of spitting facts at people. It's not going to work. You're not going to get the point across. People aren't going to want to hear what you have to say. You have to meet them where they're at and, and be able to understand where they're coming from if you're going to get your point across. Let go of your ego is a huge one. I don't think necessarily anyone in this room has this problem, but uh, I think in general, there is a, a, a an image issue with scientists. I think um, a lot of scientists, you know, just think, oh, what's the point? Like, I don't need to talk about my science. I, I'm smarter than everyone else. I know what's going on. They don't, they don't, it doesn't matter. Like these people are too dumb to understand what I do. And so there's no point in talking about it at all. I really want to challenge that. Again, I don't think I need to like hammer that message home too much, but um, it's just not true at all. I think, you know, if someone doesn't understand something, that's a failure on the scientist's behalf. Um, it's not because they're stupid. It's just because you aren't communicating effectively enough. And so you need to be able to set aside that like, oh, I'm so smart. I know everything ego that tends to tends to be present in the scientific community um, if you're going to actually get your message across. Patience, again, just because it's important. A little humor, like, again, you don't want to be a robot. You want to be able to relate to people and um, just be engaging. Um, yeah, just be, be interesting with your the things you're trying to communicate. Don't be dismissive. Be really open to people asking you questions and um, being interested in your work. Even if they don't know anything about it, you don't want to shoot them down because they don't understand. You want to, to welcome them into whatever it is you're doing. And then patience again. Okay, so that said, there are definitely a lot of challenges involved in doing this well. Um, and so basically for the rest of the talk, I'm just gonna show a handful of examples, um, all taken from the PNSN social, various social media channels, comments and posts and things, just to sort of show you what we do and um, some examples of the type of stuff I'm talking about. So number one challenge to communicating science is that science is complicated and there is a lot of nuance and it's really difficult to communicate nuance, especially over social media. Um, and I'll dive into that a little bit more. Social and political opinions are a part of, gener uh, of communicating to a general audience. They just are. I think a lot of scientists wanna be, you know, oh, politics doesn't matter to my science. Like social issues don't matter to my science. It's science, it's subjective, it doesn't matter. But when you're trying to communicate to people and have them understand what you do, it does matter because humans are emotional creatures and we're going to react to information based off of how we were raised and the environment that we live in. And that's just how it is. And so you, you can't just ignore it because you don't want to think about it. Um, and then, like I sort of mentioned earlier, like people see scientists as unrelatable and out of touch. Um, so we have a bit of an image issue that I think it's, it's our fault as a scientific community. Um, and so you want to sort of avoid all of these things and keep them all in mind when you're trying to get your point across. Um, so these are just a couple of like example comments from Facebook. Um, like this person commented that earthquakes are currently being underreported overall across the US. A lot of movement is happening currently. Check seismograms as you can. Watch your volcanoes, very active time. It's sort of a nonsense statement. It doesn't like, obviously we're not underreporting earthquakes. We're not hiding earthquakes from people, um, but there are a lot of people that think we do. And if this comment is sitting on a social media post and someone who knows nothing about earth science or geohazards comes along, they might see that and think, oh my gosh, like are, are people hiding information from us? Like, is there something going on? Should I be worried about earthquakes? Should I be worried about volcanoes? And so you can't just sort of ignore this sort of comment. Um, and then this other one, the evacuation routes at Canada Beach, Oregon are a joke. It's very 
hot topic is tsunami evacuation on the coast of Washington and Oregon and California um, and you know tsunami evacuation routes. There are a lot of people that live along the coast and who are going to struggle when a tsunami happens to evacuate properly. So there's a lot of discourse about the evacuation routes and what to do about that issue. And so it's politically charged, it's emotionally charged because the idea of being stranded on the coast during a tsunami is terrifying. Um, and so, yeah, these are just a couple examples of some of the challenges that you face in, in doing this. So to dive a little bit deeper into nuance, I don't think I need to necessarily explain that like what we do is complicated. I mean, we've all been in school for however many years learning how to do all the things we do. Um, and that's difficult to communicate in a succinct way to someone um, because you don't need to present a master's thesis to people to get them to understand things but you also need to ensure that you're not treating them like they're stupid you want to be able to like communicate at a high enough level that they feel smart they feel confident that they understand it but also not give too much information because it can be a little bit of overload um, and the problem one of the big problems i would say is that People really want absolute answers. They want a yes or a no. They want to know this earthquake's never going to happen. Yes, this earthquake's going to happen in two weeks. They want to know things for sure. And that's rarely ever the answer to things in science. Like we never, there's, it's never just a plain yes or no. Um, and so that's really hard in communicating with people. And I think the, one of the best ways to sort of get through that is to is to just explain that it's not that simple. Um, people can understand that things aren't that simple, even if they want them to be. Um, and so, you know, give a simple answer, but acknowledge that it's more complicated. Um, and, and yeah, just treat people like they can understand complicated things because they can. Um, and admitting that you don't know is okay. Um, I think a big problem that a, a, big, a reason that science has such an image problem is because we don't like to admit that we don't know or that we're wrong or have been wrong. Um, maybe we do with each other. We will you know, admit what we don't know or talk about that sort of thing, but we don't really admit it to the general public. Um, and they don't really see the scientific process and how thing, ideas get shot down or built up. Um, and so then when it does kind of reach that that sort of discourse reaches the public eye. Um, it can be very like challenging for people to know uh, what to trust or what to think about. So if anything you don't know is okay. People can understand that. Um, this is just an example I like um, because so this was in 2021. There was a earthquake in Japan. Um, I want to say magnitude seven, if I remember right. Um, you can see the seismogram, uh, the wiggles from the earthquake on seismograms in Washington. Um, and so we posted a post about it because it's interesting. Um, and my boss, the director of the Seismic Network, left this sort of additional piece of information for people is that you can understand that earthquake as an aftershock of the 2011 Tohoku magnitude nine earthquake. Even 10 years later, giant earthquakes have very long tails of aftershocks. This person commented, it's not an aftershock a decade later, it's an after space shock. Are you an intern? <laughs> Which I thought was really funny because usually it was me posting the tweets. Uh, and like, I wasn't an intern. It was my job, but also like, okay, I was an undergrad student, uh, but that my boss literally posted that. <laughs> and um, he got into a Twitter argument. I encouraged him to get into an argument with this person. So those comments down there are my from my boss. <laughs> so that was, just, I just like that example. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned earlier, science doesn't exist in a bubble. You do have to account for political and social issues that people are facing um, and just be able to like be ready to communicate your science in different ways because different parts of what you do are going to resonate with different people. Um, and so you want to be able to find the common ground. So this picture is of one of our sites, um, I want to say in Oregon, that was burnt by a wildfire. Obviously, you can see the trees around been burned down. So even though people might not care about earthquakes, I mean, in Oregon, they probably do, but just say someone doesn't, doesn't care. They don't care that earthquakes are a thing, um, but you're trying to get them to care about what you do anyways. You could say, well, we were able to actually see this, earth, uh, this wildfire rumbling through until it reached the station and then knocked it out because you could see the 
um, the, the data from the site showed the wildfire. Um, and so like we can track wildfires or we can, or, you know, even just relating to the fact that, yeah, our stuff was burned by a wildfire too. Um, your house might've been affected by a wildfire. Our stuff was affected by a wildfire. Um, meeting people where they're at um, is, is really important. Okay, so big topic, especially on social media that I wanna spend some time talking about is misinformation uh, and engaging with misinformation on social media. Um, so this is, a, this is a classic, classic comment that we would get um, uh, often, uh, just stuff like this all the time. Um, I didn't realize that earthquake conspiracy theories were a thing until I started my job at the Seismic Network. Um, there are many. Uh, and so it's definitely something that you will experience, um, especially if you do social media, but even just in general, like people have just the darndest ideas. It's, it's, it's fun. Um, so this is like a pretty classic example. Mary Greenlee is like this notorious YouTuber who posts just all this like absolutely crazy theory stuff. Um, but that said, I, I'm not, I forget exactly uh, how many subscribers Mary Greenlee has, but I have another example, like hundreds of thousands of people follow these types of people, like millions of people see their videos. So their information, their misinformation, their incorrect crackpot theories are reaching a lot of people. Um, and people who don't necessarily know any better are going to see that. And it's really emotional and scary because this is, you know, it's about talking about Yellowstone erupting, uh, something about Noah's Ark, I don't know. Um, but uh, it's it's really emotional because the idea people are terrified of the idea of Yellowstone erupting. Even though the science says it's physically impossible, if you don't know that, it's a really terrifying thought to have, just like have this giant volcano in the center of the United States blow up is like really scary. Um, so you have to deal with this sort of thing a lot. Um, but how much effort do you put into combating it because you could spend your entire day all day every single day just responding to comments and responding to people posting this kind of information and at a certain point is it even doing any good um so i sort of want to talk about the the my experience in, in dealing with this and sort of what i've gotten out of it is that in general i think dealing with misconception is worth your time um, and worth doing Engaging with like intentional misinformation is not um, because intentional misinformation is usually posted by someone who either knows what they're doing and they're making a profit off of it in some way. Um, so they're not going to stop because they have no incentive to or they are willfully ignorant and you giving them facts and figures and data is not going to change their mind. Um, and so beyond just leaving a comment for anyone else to say like, hey, this is misinformation, here are some actual sources, go read this instead. Um, it's it's not necessarily worth your time to engage in in fighting with the, the trolls and the people that are like intentionally trying to misinform people. Um, but that said, there's a lot of misconceptions that aren't necessarily insidious. They're just people don't understand correctly. They were told some wrong information at some point and that's what they remember. Um, and, and so that's what they go with, but it's wrong, but those people want to learn and they can learn better. So this is a really good, I really like this example. Um, this is, there's actually a Facebook group that used to be associated with the seismic network, but is no longer actually run by the, like officially affiliated with the PNSM, but it's run by seismologists and, um, people from the PNSM. And it's basically just a forum for people who aren't earthquake scientists to ask questions about geohazards and volcano hazards and earthquakes and stuff and get an actual response back from an expert. And so I really like this one because this person gave a really common misconception that small earthquakes are good because they release pressure. Um, that's not true. It, as this group expert in, uh, in the group commented, small earthquakes are a good way to eliminate fault surfaces because you can see where rocks are slipping, but it takes a million magnitude five earthquakes to release the energy equivalent of one magnitude nine. So like one magnitude five earthquake isn't, isn't doing all that much. Um, this is a really common misconception. You see this a lot. People really like this idea. I think 
because maybe they heard it somewhere once and they run with it. And it's kind of a nice idea, right? Like, oh, thank God we had a magnitude five earthquake, nothing terrible happened. And now we're not gonna have a bigger one. Like that's kind of reassuring, right? So you can kind of understand where people are coming from and in, in relating to that bit of information, but it's misleading and not true. So it's sort of our job to go back and correct that as this person did. Um, and, and then this person said, thank you for correcting me. Send me down the earthquake research rabbit hole. Um, and I learned a lot. I took geology in college over 30 years ago. And at that time, this is what we were taught. Now I'm better educated about how they work. Thank you again. What a lovely <laughs> interaction. <laughs> Isn't that great? So it is possible. It actually happens a lot. Um, so yeah, it's definitely worth engaging with this kind of um, sort of misconception versus misinformation. Um, and just to sort of illustrate one more example, um, this, I'll start with Dutch sense, is no very notorious um, earthquake misinformation pusher. This person claims that they can predict earthquakes and they post all this content about, you know, the next, in the next week, there's going to be a, ma a massive earthquake that's going to destroy California and all of the people are going to die and all of the scary stuff. And of course, because it's really scary and emotional, a lot of people pay attention. They have 600,000 subscribers um, on their YouTube channel and like millions of people watch their videos. Um, a lot of people will comment on our posts saying, you know, oh, go to this person's video. Like they are telling the real truth, that sort of thing. I have never seen a single one of their videos because it's just not worth my time. Um, this is like the type of content that I just like wouldn't engage with because there's nothing I can say or do to convince this person that what they're doing is wrong. Um, so that's sort of the, I just wouldn't, I wouldn't bother. Um, this on the other hand um, is, is sort of a fun example of um, basically what happened was, um, if I remember right, there was a paper that was published about this ocean bottom seep off the coast of Oregon that was discovered, it was discovered in like 2015 or something like that, but the paper was only recently published. Um, and, you know, as scientists, if any of you know anything about submissions on science, like, oh, this is pretty interesting. This is something we'd be interested in studying. It doesn't change our underlying assumptions about the Cascadia subduction zone and like the hazard and potential for the next megathrust earthquake, but it is something scientifically interesting. However, that said, it got completely taken over by the tabloid cycle. This is a, snap, a snapshot from the UK Independent tabloids from across the world were reporting about this thing. And of course they were misconstruing exactly what it meant. So the, the headline reads, footage shows leak in Pacific Ocean that could unleash magnitude nine earthquake. That's wrong. It's not, that's not what it means at all. Um, but uh, this got a lot of attention. It, I literally, this took up my entire like two or three days, just responding to emails and questions. And my boss had to do interviews with the news and everything. Like it took over a lot of time. Um, but because it was so popular and got so much attention, it was worth us explaining why it was wrong, what the actual context was. Um, and it gave us the opportunity to teach a lot of people about the truth behind that statement. So that was something that we we actually like spent a lot of effort sort of engaging with, even though it's false and misleading. Okay, so now I wanna take a break and I want you all to think about your field of science, your research, um, and what are common pieces of misinformation or misconceptions in your field? Um, and how would you respond to a comment about them? So maybe like turn to the person or two to your right and we'll just take a few minutes to like sort of think about it. Think about pieces of information that people get wrong. If someone commented on your post, what would you, how would you respond? And folks on Zoom, you're also welcome to to contribute if you want, I can see the comments. So, um.
So maybe if there's anyone that talked about something that's not earthquake or volcano related that they want to share. Of course, classic, classic. Fake moon landing, that's a good one. Yep. Anyone else? It can be earthquake related now if you. So I didn't take that time. I was borrowed a stuff by guys like, what's it going to be in the future? Like, mm. when your state model show is going to go in the future? That's not. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I like it. Cool. Let's see. Did anyone want to say machine anything? Aliens. I have questions about ocean drilling and either that ocean drilling causes earthquakes <laughs> or that the ocean drilling stops earthquakes from happening. Mm -hmm. uh, it's either side of the spectrum. <laughs> cool. Excellent. Cool. Well, I just wanted to sort of do that so that to get you all thinking about like issues that you might face when you're trying to communicate your science to people. I think it's important to sort of keep in the back of your mind. Um, and uh, the key to sort of getting ahead of that misinformation is to is to exactly do this, is to anticipate what people might be thinking and to even communicate that the truth in advance so that they never even really have a chance to share the like crazy things that people come up with. So um, that's something that we tried to do a lot is like anytime we knew we were posting about something that might be sort of controversial or could be taken in a wrong way, we would try to anticipate that and actually like post more details so that people could understand like what is actually happening and what the truth might be so that they don't sort of fall into that misconception hole. It's tricky though. It's definitely a skill that, that takes some time. Um, and so just one one more case study is... 
the best to ever do it. The USGS Volcanoes social media team is the best, at least in the United States. Um, there is no one better at science communication than the people that run the USGS Volcanoes page, in, in my opinion. Um, they just do a really, really good job of answering everyone's questions, even the completely ridiculous ones. They take the time to give them thoughtful and insightful answers. Um, they respond to people that are claiming that they're hiding earthquakes or that they know when the next volcano is going to erupt and they're just not telling people. They respond to all of those and they are really open about where they get their sources and they give people links so that they can learn more and resources to do better. Um, and I think they just do a great job. So here are two examples. Um, the first one I like is, uh, this was on a, I believe on a post about the Mount St. Helens eruption anniversary. So this person is like, the first person's referring to like, oh, Mount St. Helens might erupt, hee And they're, you know, you can tell they're being joking and sort of, they're not being serious about it but they still took the time to respond. And they answered in also sort of a jokey way, you know, they know that they're not being too, they don't have to be too serious about it, but they're also like, yeah, this is normal. Don't worry about it. Um, and so, and then just another person just asked a question. I could have chosen like millions of, of examples. So um, if you're ever looking for an example of someone to model when you're sort of responding to people's questions, I would recommend looking at their, their pages. Okay, so sort of moving on, just like two more sort of serious -er things that I want to cover are just sort of a reality check about when you're talking to people that aren't scientists. And so the reality is that people are not excited about your research as you are. Sorry, it's <laughs> it's the truth, unfortunately. And um, they, but that said, um, it's still worth telling people about what you're doing. But they may actually like even feel negatively towards what you have to tell them, um, especially if you're in geohazards or um, studying climate. There's tons of people that feel negatively about climate change and climate research. Um, or, you know, if you're studying earthquakes and you tell people that there's going to be a really big earthquake someday, they're not going to like to hear that. Um, and I think it's just important to sort of acknowledge that. It's really important to acknowledge those feelings and that sometimes the things we study are hard and um, serious and um, and like impact people's lives in negative ways. So like this is just an example of last year, the earthquakes in Turkey. Um, you know, we just made a, a post about like, you know, acknowledging that like this was a terrible tragedy, tragedy. Um, even though we as scientists like find earthquakes scientifically interesting, we get excited when earthquakes happen. Um, we acknowledge that they are not they're not good things. We don't want them to happen and they impact a lot of people and can cause a lot of damage. Um, and so these are just kind of examples, not from that post, but like of sort of the feelings that people have about geohazards and, and um, the things that you want to sort of acknowledge to people because no one is going to listen to you if you say like, if you know a big earthquake happens, you're like, oh, but it was so cool and we can do all this cool science with it. People don't want to hear that. That's a terrible message. So um, it's really important to just acknowledge how people feel about whatever your field is, um, if they have negative sort of associations or thoughts with what you're doing. And then on the flip side of that, it's also important to acknowledge your own feelings. And it's okay to feel like really bummed that people don't care about what you're doing or they think they want to be really adversarial against you. Um, so this is an example of this person. Um, commented on the post about shake alert. They said, I'm sorry, but by the time anyone's brain realizes that the alert is happening and why it's too late, I grew up in an earthquake zone and this is pointless. Um, and then some other person uh, responded about like the benefits of shake alert and like they sort of nailed what the whole point is. Um, but the person still uh, responded and said, you might be right for some people. I actually ran a timer to see. I still don't think it's a good use of taxes for the masses. LEOFR, yes, but regular people, I don't know. We're pretty stupid. Well, thanks. Um, <laughs> so that, I mean, the end was kind of funny, but that's kind of a bummer, right? To like have someone, random person online be like, yeah, everything you do is like a waste of my taxpayer dollars. Like that's kind of a bummer. Yeah. What's LEOFR? I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. I was trying to figure that out. Uh, yeah. So yeah, you're not going to get through to everyone is basically the point I'm trying to make. Um, and that is okay. Like, there's just going to be some people that don't care or they don't want to know. And that's just the reality. And you just sort of have to be okay with that. You can't win everyone over. 
Um, so what do people care about? Um, at least for in earthquakes, people care actually a lot about earthquakes. Um, they want to share their experiences. A lot of comments that we get are just people saying like, oh yeah, I felt that earthquake, or I was there during the 1980 Mount St. Helens eruption. I remember it. Here's my story. That's what all of these comments are. Every time, every year, the during the anniversary of the Mount St. Helens eruption, we just get tons and tons of comments from people being like, oh yeah, I remember I was in elementary school. I was, I had just finished a camping trip in, in the blast zone or whatever it was. Um, they just really want to share their stories. Um, or, you know, when an earthquake happens, they want to say, yeah, I felt that earthquake. I was there. Um, and so giving space for people to do that is, is I think a really good thing to do when you're trying to communicate about these problems. They want to learn something new. We get tons of questions from people that are just, there's questions. They want to learn something. Um, and I think, you know, engaging those people is how you sort of maintain a good reputation as someone that will answer people's questions and is willing to engage with questions and makes people feel like their questions aren't stupid and that they can, they can ask those questions. Um, and then of course they want to have information that's gonna help them protect themselves, their loved ones, their property from damaging events uh, like an earthquake. And so I think a, a really key thing to do is to find a way to relate your work to what people are interested in. And that might not always be the way you think it is. So we spend a lot of time and effort talking about earthquake hazards and you know preparing yourself for the next earthquake, do X, Y, Z to be ready for an earthquake. But sometimes it's not the most interesting thing to people. So I'm gonna dive into this fun, this just fun saga of social media posts we did that started back in 2011 with the beast quake. Um, if you're not from the Seattle area, you perhaps don't know, uh, Marshawn Lynch is one of the stars of the Seattle Seahawks a couple years ago um, in 20. 11? Yeah, I was 11, so I don't really remember. <laughs> um, but there was like, he made an epic touchdown run in a playoff game that was, um, that, you know, was a big deal, obviously. Um, it basically clinched the Seahawks, uh, it basically won them the game. Um, and he made this like really, really incredible run. Um, that run, the cheering from that event was recorded on a nearby seismometer. Um, and has forever since been dubbed the beast quake. Um, and so here's the beast quake. Um, this was like, that people loved this. This was like people's favorite thing ever was the beast quake. It bring it comes up all the time. Um, and so you can see like, this is the PNSN's version. This is the Seattle Times published this um, in an article. Uh, actually, this was from just a couple years ago, commemorating the 10th anniversary, but it's like same thing. Um, so, you know, we analyzed, they analyzed it to be like, okay, he like, he breaks through the line, he broke another tackle. And like, you can see the difference in like the cheer of the crowd during this event. This isn't an earthquake. Like to be clear, this is not a fault in the ground breaking and like an actual earthquake. This is just people like jumping up and cheering and stomping during that run. Um, but we recorded it and it was called the Beast Quake. Um, just like note that even then with like one of our most popular things that has ever come out of the seismic network was that they still get it wrong. It was not an earthquake. It did not cause an earthquake, um, but a uh, huge PR victory, I would say, for getting people interested in, in seismology. And every time something interesting happens at the football stadium in Seattle now, people want to know, like, did it, cause, did it cause an earthquake? It didn't, it never caused us an earthquake, but like basically did we record the signal from that event on our nearby seismogram. So then that led to, oh, oh, also this for the, I'm famous. Uh, just, just so you know, Marshall Lynch reached out my time. <laughs> Needed to plug that a little bit. That was like the coolest thing. Um, <laughs> uh, and so that led to then, yeah, people ask all the time about like, okay, um, can, did you see anything else happening at the stadium during other events? And so a couple years ago, uh, two years ago, the Sounders were in this big CONCACAF championship game, I think. Um, and uh, you can see every time the Sounders score a goal, it shows up on our seismogram. Um, and so this was our most liked tweet ever <laughs> two years ago. Like this just gathers way more engagement than like literally anything else we do. Even our posts about earthquakes, like when an earthquake happens, people don't care as much as they care about sports. So um, this is like a, a great way to sort of you know relate what you do to something that people are interested in. Um, and it's not just sports. 
recently, a certain someone came to play a show at uh, Lumen Field in Seattle, and people were dying to know who created the bigger earthquake, Marshawn Lynch or Taylor Swift. The answer is Taylor Swift. <laughs> and uh, of course, like, you know, this it's it generates a whole discussion of like, okay, what does it actually mean if it's not an earthquake? And like, how do you convert the like people want to know what is the magnitude of that earthquake? Uh, that's a little hard to say because it's not actually an earthquake. So like explaining that to people is a little hard, but this gathered like so much attention. Um, and it was really spearheaded by actually a professor at uh, Western Washington University. So I have to give Jackie Kaplanauer back the <laughs> the friends for this but this went to this like the people with the pns and put this together like this you can go and download this and print it out if you are interested and this is like each of these songs is colored like that's one of the songs they color coded it they like got recordings from the show to like match up the songs they even like I, I don't exactly understand how they did this analysis but they like analyzed the frequency of the songs and were able to basically Re reverse engineer the songs. So you can listen to a recording on the PNSN YouTube of Taylor Swift's concert as recorded by Station KDK just across the street. It doesn't sound as good, but <laughs> um, so I just like, I love that. I love this whole example of like, you know, this is not earthquake related at all, but it is what people care about. And it's like a really, really good way to sort of relate what we do as scientists to things that people actually care about. Um, and once they're involved in this, once they say, hey, that's actually really cool, they'll wanna know how'd you do that? And then we can explain, oh, we have a seismometer. Why do we have seismometers? Didn't you know we can get earthquakes in Seattle? You should be prepared in case an earthquake happens. And so then we can sort of start that relationship with people who may have never heard of us before. Um, so I think it's really important to find ways to basically relate what you do to people. So I was, Going to, oh, there's two more fun examples. Like I said, I was going to show some other examples of accounts I love. I think uh, these are two other organizations that do like vaguely scientific communication. Um, and I think I just, they do a really good job of um, being a part of like internet culture and relating what they do to like internet culture and memes and, um, and like making posts that just people think are hilarious. I think they're hilarious. Um, and so yeah, Washington Department of Natural Resources and Oklahoma Department of Fish of Wildlife Conservation are like two really good examples. Their accounts are hilarious. Give them a look if you're interested. Um, but in these posts, like they're ridiculous, right? They're just memes. But then they also are like, actually learn something about beavers. Like here's this ridiculous post about a beaver, but we're actually also gonna teach you something about beavers. So they do a good job of like making jokes relating to people, but then also teaching them something. So um, I think that that's really like effective way to do science communication. Um, I was gonna have us do this, but I think I'll, I'll skip it just for time so I can have some time for questions, but I just sort of wanna leave an overall sort of takeaway from my experience communicating um, to the public as a scientist. Um, I think it's really important to engage people's curiosity. You want people to be interested in what you're doing. You wanna be able to relate to them, um, acknowledge the negative emotions that come with whatever it is you're talking about, um, but give people info that's gonna help them sort of push through that. Um, people are not stupid. You can commu uh, communicate difficult concepts to people. You are not smarter than the average person, you just happen to have learned more than that person about this specific field. I'm sure some other random person, if you're, you know, non-scientist could teach you about whatever it is they do and you have not, no idea about it. So it's not a matter of intelligence. It, scientists aren't smarter than normal people. They are able to understand complicated things, I promise. Um, and it's our responsibility to be able to break down those complicated topics that we study into something that someone's going to understand. So if someone doesn't understand something, that's our fault, not theirs. And that's just sort of what I wanna leave, the message I wanna leave everyone with. I really like this comment. There's a handful of examples of these, but um, this person was just responding to um, an article about, actually this might've been about the Swift, Taylor Swift earthquake. <laughs> um, but they said, well, I'm a 1975 English lit major and never got along much with math, science, let alone physics. This page has helped me understand so much better. I appreciate all the knowledge and expertise shared here. Thank you. This article has great illustrations and photos. I love the interview. And just, they were overall really happy that they learned something. So 
Um, that's it. I'll leave you with this excellent picture of PNSN's first director, Steve Malone, um, installing seismometers on Mount St. Helens days before the eruption, holding the bear. So with that, I will take your questions. <laughs> So I guess one of the main tools you used is Twitter, mm -hmm. and it's uh, changed in recent times. It sure have has. You seen the influence of those changes while you were over the time you were working there. Absolutely, yeah. So I, um, I was like, this was my job when. Elon Musk took over Twitter and like started to change everything. Um, and there definitely has been an impact. I wouldn't necessarily recommend that anyone start a Twitter account if you don't already have one, because it's just, it has definitely gotten a lot worse. Um, I, uh, just from a like practical standpoint of like making posts and things, it's more difficult. Um, definitely the type of engagement you get is a lot more combative, um, a lot less productive from what I've seen. Um, yeah, it's it's a bit of a shame, but um, I mean, we even just get less engagement on our posts. Like in, and I, I haven't, you know, for the last four or five months or whatever since I left the job, I haven't been um, posting on behalf of the PNS anymore, obviously. But I was looking through their recent tweets to like make this presentation, and like, there's a lot less engagement. Um, there's yeah, just even the like tweets about earthquakes, like the automatic earthquake, we basically, anytime there's an earthquake above a magnitude three, it automatically posts to Twitter. Um, and like those just like aren't getting engagement anymore, which is kind of weird because those were usually like very high engagement because people, you know, wanted to show that they felt it or and like, you know, oh my God, there was an earthquake, I've got to tell my friends. Um, so yeah, I, there's definitely has been a change in, in Twitter since like since Elon Musk took over slash just over the last couple of months even. Um, which is kind of a shame because it was a really powerful tool for better or worse um, for communicating things. It was also difficult though because you only had 180 characters or whatever they changed it a couple times. But um, it it was it was a good exercise in being able to communicate your thoughts succinctly. So it's kind of a shame that it's not as good as it used to be. But that's yeah, that's the reality. Yeah. That was like a fun talk. Thank mm -hmm. you. Um... I'm curious if you talk a bit about like, uh, I mean specifically to your to your job at the PNSM, like how much freedom did you have in the social media account, but also how much like support did you have? Like, yeah, you're just like an undergraduate. Yes, and like yeah, it's really interesting to hear about. Yeah, that. yeah, totally. That's actually a really good point. That something I probably should have mentioned. Um, yeah, so I got this job in February 2020. Yeah. I had just started taking my very first earth science class. I didn't know anything when I got this job. Um, and so sort of the, the procedure that PNSN uses for like putting things out on the website or on social media or whatever it is, is like basically we have a Slack channel for, um, for social media and someone that wants to make a post can post a draft and then two people have to approve it before it can get posted to the internet. Um, and often that involves lots of rounds of like edits and people have opinions on things. Um, the interesting sort of other side of this that I didn't really talk about is uh, the communicating with scientists part of this. That was often the more challenging part because the, I mean, like, like that issue I talked about about communicating nuance is sometimes you do have to simplify things and that's okay. But some, pe some people really feel strongly about how the words you use when you simplify things and like the point you're trying to get across. And so like I have gone back and forth about a single word dozens of times just because a seismologist didn't like the specific word I chose because it was like misconstruing things, which is important to think about, but also not something to get hung up on. Um, but yeah, so I got initially like a lot of support from the seismic network, like even answering emails. Um, I like, I didn't know how to answer people's questions about earthquakes when I started this job. And so I would like post them and be like, hey, could someone help me answer this question? And so then I get some like long detailed response from the scientists and then I would sort of do my best to, to narrow it down and try to pick out the parts that were most relevant to whatever question the person asked um, and then send it out. Eventually over time, I think I got a little more freedom. We still had the like to approve, like two thumbs up rule before anything gets posted, but um, I definitely just got better at like, you know, writing things that both the scientists and the people, the, the general public would like, um, and also a little bit more freedom to like, yeah, just answer questions without like sending it to 
the group first or uh, responding to comments is actually something that I sort of had free reign over. So the initial post would get like approved by a handful of people, but more or less I, I was able to just respond to comments on my own. Um, if I had a question about it, I would like post it and we'd have the same sort of thing of like, okay, two people like give some comments and feedback and like help me answer this question. But oftentimes when I was responding to comments, it was just me responding to comments. So um, yeah, as I got better at the job, they gave me a little more leeway to sort of do what I wanted to do the way I wanted to do it, which was great. So yeah, but I definitely wouldn't have been able to do it without the help and people teaching me. Like I probably learned more about earth science through this job than I did in class, I would say maybe. <laughs> At least the stuff that's relevant to what I do now. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I want to follow up on that part in terms of like how it's helped you think as a scientist, because I feel like of most of the conversations that I have with like older academics are like, we weren't trained to be like science communicators mm -hmm. and like our PhDs. And I feel like that's like a huge argument with like advisors as well, where it's like you're here to only focus on your science. Right. And so I'm wondering like doing this job and now being in grad school and like kind of thinking about science as an undergrad and like a lab system, like has it changed like your thinking or the like scientific process that you have when you do your work? I think so. I mean, I think I'm definitely, it definitely makes me think more about how my science is going to impact people. And I'm better able to like answer those types of questions. So like anytime I explain what I do now, like my slow slip research stuff that I'm doing here, um, I like people ask, like they'll ask, oh, so like, is your research going to lead to like being able to predict earthquakes? And I'm like, well, no, not not really. But like, let me explain. And so then I sort of, you know, uh, like I'll, I'll basically what when people ask what I do now, I like various I start very bare bones. I'm like, OK, do you know what a subduction zone is? Um, and if they know, great. Then I sort of know like, OK, they know this little bit. I can maybe be a little bit more technical when I'm answering their question. If they don't know what a subduction zone is, then I know where to start and I can like sort of go from there. Um, and, and yeah, I think it definitely, yeah, I think it makes me think about how my research is impactful of other like people. Um, and I, I want to continue doing this. I think it's really important. Um, I see the like relevance in, in doing it, um, because like basically every single day I would get to answer someone's question about earthquakes and like most days someone would leave their conversation with me knowing a little bit more about earthquakes, feeling a little bit more empowered to make an earthquake kit or, you know, something like that. And so like, I, I mean, I could probably, it's probably not a stretch for me to say that like, there are people that are better prepared for earthquakes because of my job and like my work that I did, um, which is really great. And sort of, for me, it's like the why I do science. Um, that's not necessarily true for everyone. I, I don't even think that has to be true for everyone, but, um, but for me personally, like I want to, I want to do science that's like impactful and relevant to people, um, and I think we all do. So, um, but it's only impactful and relevant to people if you tell the people about it. So, yeah. Questions in the room online. Maybe a very short question. Mm -hmm. Now that Twitter is no longer good, what do you recommend? That's a good question. So I, so yeah, I, I would, I did my job like as the PNSN, like I would sign my name when I read, respond to people's emails, but otherwise like I was the PNSN. People have no idea who like I was. It was just me speaking as the PNSN. I don't necessarily, I don't really do this anymore now that I'm here um, and that this isn't my job. Like I don't really do much science communication. So um, I'm not, really sure if I haven't really been following the whole like the dissolving of Twitter and people going to other platforms and things I don't know I know that there's still a lot of people that use Twitter um and and like the PNSN still uses Twitter um so so it is I mean it's still an option um Facebook Instagram TikTok if you like really feel like it are really like those are those are what people are using nowadays if you want to go the social media route you don't have to go the social media route you can um you know go volunteer at elementary schools and talk about geoscience to elementary school students or um you know find find whatever it is whatever niche you want to do um but yeah i would say that some of the the most popular geoscience like I don't want to say influencer, but but influencers. Uh, I've seen a couple of people that do TikTok really well. So um, yeah, I'd say that's sort of taking over and like the or even just the short current like short form video 
is really popular and, and I think a good way to communicate things. So, yeah. Well, let's thank Mackenzie Long. Same time next week, Tuesday, second floor. <laughs> <laughs>